Hello and welcome. I'm glad you could join us today for a 3 a.m. worship hour. We're, we're thrilled. We realize you have a lot of things that's maybe going on in your life and a lot of choices that you can make that you've chosen to watch 3 a.m. today, and we're very happy about that. Praise God. Well, we're good. We, I think it's an exciting study for today because it's something that's discussed in a lot of circles sometime, and you'll notice that the, the title, low, there, the, there's a limit to God's grace. And, and you don't really hear that an awful lot. And so I, I pray as we go along in this study, it'll become clear to you and clear to me that maybe there is a limit to God's grace. A lot of people say, oh, it's just limitless in regards to what we do and what we say and how we live our life. Uh, God's grace is there and just sufficient. Oh, absolutely. Praise God for that. So we're not trying to tear any of that good principle down. But I think it's something that we need to really look at so that we don't, you know, just say, well, you know, God, I live the way I want to live, but your grace will get me on through. So anyway, we, we think it's an exciting study. Again, glad you join us and, you know, get your family around, if you will, and get what you need, you know, to write some things down as we move along as quickly as we can in the time that's allotted. There's a lot of material to cover. But anyway, we're so glad and so very, very thankful that we could spend this time with you. And yeah, I think it'd be nice, you know, you let 3ABN know that and write your little cards and letters and you don't, maybe you don't realize how important that is, you know, to those who work like people at 3ABN and other ministries, uh, how important it is once in a while that you care enough to just drop a little note and say, maybe just thank you. We're not looking for praises. We're not looking for that. It's, it's the idea that other people are watching and that God is blessing and it's helping them along the way. You, you just... You, we just we th it's an encouragement please just know that it's an encouragement to those who are laboring every day who work behind the scenes and those who are working in front and so on and so forth so th thank you for that commitment i know that you're making right now again we're glad you join us we're going to have prayer right here uh, again we're going to ask for god's blessing i know that i need it and maybe today you're saying you know i'm in need of of god's grace as we look at it and we're going to be looking at grace and then probation probationary time. So kind of put those two studies together. Only the Holy Spirit can do that. So I'm going to kneel up here and where you can, let's pray together, shall we? Merciful Father in heaven, thank you for the privilege of prayer. And again, I'm always very grateful and thankful that you can, we can call you our Father. Thank you that your word says that we are sons and daughters of God. That's just way beyond my mind. I, I thank you for that. And so we can come freely, boldly to the throne of grace to say, oh Lord, have mercy. We need help in our time of need, and today we need help. We can't put anything together. The, the pieces are all out there, but we can't do it the proper way, but you can. So we invite that Holy Spirit to be with every one of your children, those who watch, those who view, those who somehow listen, that it will come clear into their hearts and to their minds and will be drawn closer to Jesus. Bless everything that's said and done. Every person is working so hard and diligently to make sure these programs get into the people of God who want to hear what is truth, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, praise the Lord. Again, we're going to be looking. There is a limit to God's grace. And so uh, I, uh, maybe if it'd be all right to do this, I, a lot of times you, you, you want to throw something out like that, and then you go ahead and spend 30 or 40 minutes in, in proving your point. And I'd like to start out just kind of like, oh, I want to give you at least what I think about a limit to God's grace. Is there a limit to God's grace? In case some of you say, oh, it's an hour's a long time. I want to kind of get to the bottom of it. But really, we need to go through all the steps and try to find out, you know, the reason why we came up with what we, our reasoning here. We need to really come up with that. And the um, person asked one time, they said, well, how do we obtain grace? How do we really obtain grace? How, how, how does it really come about? And so if you... If you don't know today, I'm, I want to encourage you with this. Please let me encourage you with this. If you want to say, I, I'm not sure about God's grace or how to obtain the grace of God, and then you're saying to me, there's a limit to the, uh, God's grace, uh, how do we do that? Well, I'm going to encourage you. I think it's a very simple point. If you haven't really, if you don't know the answer to that, I'm going to ask you, we always could talk about going to the closet, you know, and, and, and praying. I'm going to encourage you to go to the closet today, as it were, as it were, open that door, get down on your knees and begin to pray to God. Plead with him, God, just like David did. You know what, David? He said, create in me a clean heart, O God. That's what we should be doing. Create a clean heart in me. R renew a right spirit in me. Now, remember, there's some things that, we need, that has, needs to be set up so that God can pour out his spirit, his power, and his grace. Now, you, we renew a right spirit. 
And I think one thing is we need to be earnest. We need to be sincere when we go to that closet and we're asking about this thing called grace. And then we might have to, just food for thought, wrestle with God, as it were, wrestle with him like Jacob did. Lord, I'm just not going to let you go until, and you realize that, until you, until you bless me. Or maybe you might say, I'm going to do like Jesus did in the garden. You remember? Absolutely. It, it, in fact, he, you know, with, with, with tears and, as it were, great drops of blood until he, he had the answer. And maybe that's what we need to do today. And that simply means you want to know how to obtain grace. There's going to have to be, you're going to have to put forth an effort. Put forth an effort. You've got to do something as it were. Again, it's not by work's sake, but you have to put forth an effort. Again, praying, laboring, going to your closet. And then I think you've put, and then I, I read some counsel one time I thought it was very good. It, it said, if you're looking for this kind of grace, don't leave your closet until you know you've obtained that by faith. In other words, stay on your knees until you know that God has answered that prayer. Because he wants you to pray that. He wants to bestow his grace and mercy upon you and upon me. But stay in there until you know that the strength of God is inside of you right now. And, uh, you know, and, and then I think the bottom line simply is the Bible gives, says watch and pray. Now, think with me for a moment. Just watch and pray. Once you've made that commitment to God, then you will continue to watch and we continue to pray and to live that life. There is a limit to God's grace. I want to read from the Word of God, and, and, and you mark this one down because then we'll dissect it in just a moment. In Romans chapter 5, verse uh, 18. Romans 5, verse 18. Now, again, as we read this, and then we'll go over in just a moment. But it, it, it's, it's really powerful. Romans 5. Verse 18, it says, Therefore, as by, thy, uh, by offense, one judgment came upon what? Upon all men to condemnation. Even so, that by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men and to justification of life. Now, you'd be surprised why we look at that and how we want to dissect it just a little bit. It's because, at least in my opinion, there are many who... Um, twist a little bit and try to make it say something that it really doesn't say. And so as we do, we'll dissect that a little bit more in a moment. But I'd like to read from you from a, 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 a statement. You know, I'm a believer. Some of you may not realize, but I still, I'm a believer in, in spirit of prophecy. I'm a believer, you know, the, the things that God gives to his last day church that we so desperately need. And I might say this, one of the reasons maybe that sometimes we seem to fall short, we're a little bit weak, we we, we fail to read this gift, as it were, that God has given to us that makes it very clear and very plain the direction that God would have us to go. I, I just praise him for it and I thank him for it. And again, I've, I've been reading these for many, 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 many years. I haven't found anything that, that I believe contradicts the word of God. Remember, truth first, the word of God. As a, you know, again, the spirit of prophecy is lesser light to lead us to the great light for sure. Anyway, five testimonies, two oh eight. It reads like this. Pay close attention. Again, we, the, what's the sermon title? Now, there is, there is a limit to God's grace. It starts out like this. There are limits even to the forbearance of God. Does that make sense? Most of us realize there is a, there's a limit to the forbearance of God. In other words, we can go so far. But notice, many are exceeding these boundaries. So the challenge might come to you, to me today. Are we exceeding these boundaries that God has, that he sets up? Are we? We need to be very careful if we do, because that, you know, that could be very dangerous. They have overrun the, uh-oh, they've overrun the limits of grace. And therefore, God must interfere to do what? To vindicate his own honor. Oh, isn't that wonderful when you really think about it? God is there. God is going to help us. He's going to encourage us. But there is a what? There is a limit. As, and, and the big thing today all through the study is, have we reached that limit? Or are we one that's just challenging God and, and, and we're putting off what we know we should be doing today? And there's things that we know we have light on and we're just not living up to it because mm, we like the world or things are in the world. Oh, please pay attention to this. And I'll give you an example of what I just read there from 5 Testimonies 208. The example, the Amorites, you remember them? 
God said, notice this, that, they, that to them, we, that we're going to endure their iniquity. Well, oh, they were idolaters, and boy, they were, we'll talk more about it as we go on, but they were idolaters, and they were living, you know, in the land of Cana, and God had promised that to Israel, and so on and so forth. And basically the word is, let's drive them out. And notice what happened. God said, not yet, because their cup of iniquity is not full yet. What does that mean? Oh, the, God has a limit then, doesn't he? So he let it go, and he let it go, and he let it go until there was never going to be any other changes. And then why let it go? I think that makes sense. He would not visit them in judgment until the cup was full, till they continued on in the, you know, the case is closed, they say. No more opportunity would be given to them. And again, more on that a little bit later. Maybe, hopefully, it makes some more sense to us. But in Romans 5, verse 18, notice there we talked about what Paul, Paul was pinning some lines. And in these lines, he pins some things. And there's some questions we're going to ask as we go because it's important. Those we some, not everybody, but some who interpret these lines here, these verses there, verse 18, Romans chapter 5, uh, they have... I want to call them conflicting explanations of, of this passage of Scripture, the, the gospel, they call it. And the main point of contention is this, is that, is that we call the last three words of that phrase. Remember, it starts out, the free gift came upon all men. So when people say, oh, well, it came upon all men, that means regardless of what I do, how I live, what is that, oh, great, it's going to be given to me, I'm going to make it anyway. Is that really what it means? The three last three words is unto justification of life. Think on that just for a moment, justification of life. Now, this phrase usually is understood to mean that the justification is provided. We come to Christ, right? We're justified in, in a moment, right? We confess our sin. He's faithful and just to forgive us. We're justified. That's a beautiful thing, right? And justification can only come by Jesus, isn't that right? By, by Calvary, by the blood. There's no doubt about that. And then we look at it because it, it's provided by Jesus and his life of obedience where you, where I've been disobedient. Interesting with those words. And of course, it, we, it's certainly his death. But it says it's freely given or made available to all men. So there's something about that that we need to look at maybe a little bit closer the problem is, if there is a problem here, is the life spoken. We're talking about life. The life spoken here, is it the life that we are living right now, which is temporal, which is probationary, or is it really talking about eternal life? Well, hey, that's, that, to me, that's it's some questions that we need to answer. There's no doubt about it. And that, Well, that raises another question. Why not let you can write that down, you know, jot it down in your book if you want to, and just say, okay, another question here. Is the justification given unconditional huh, to all men? Now, remember, grace, grace, grace. We're saying there's a limit to God's grace when the cup is full. But really, is this justification that people say, you know, it's given unconditionally to all men? Question, or, notice this, or is it made available to all men? Is it made available to all men? And then, if it's received, it would be received on the condition of obedience. So those who say, well, don't worry about being obedient or, you know, worry about what God has to say. We just, he said he makes it all available to us. But there's some good questions here. Is it made available to all men? I believe God's grace is made available to anyone who wants to accept it. But there are conditions. There's always conditions, are there not? And sometimes those conditions are the things that challenge me in my Christian walk. If I'm going to do this and this, what about? And again, it's not about work's sake at all. It's about, about honoring what God has said in his word. And so, you know, we have to be willing to obey the laws of God, our creator, and to justification of life. So there's something about justification of life and obedience so I'm wondering how we're going to look at that today as we, as we study this. And maybe to keep us on track, because I realize there'll be a lot of things that's, that we cover today that sometimes we need to keep right on the, on, on, on the track here, is let's use this thought. 
Adam and Eve in the very beginning, I think most people follow that, that plane of, of thought. They were created. Now listen, when they were created in the Garden of Eden, we realized it was, they were perfect. Isn't that right? There was no sin. But really, they were put there on probation. Think about it. They were on probation. If there was no probation for them and contingent upon obedience, right, then why was there a tree, if that's the word good or evil, or a choice that they could make? So we just go back to that and say, okay, they probation. Eternal life would be theirs. They could live forever. Notice this, right? Only if they demonstrated their willingness to live in obedience to the laws of God. I think that, that makes sense to me. And of course, they made an opposite choice, didn't they? We can always go, remember, if you want to know truth, you can always go back to the beginning and look how God had set it up. I've often said, even in this world we look at now, we have these, this is going on in the world, that's going on in the world. But really, with all of these things that we see that's going on in the world, all the stuff that goes, right, would it really be if Adam and Eve had remained loyal to God? Interesting thought, isn't it? But still yet, we have to be lo loyal. Adam and Eve had to be loyal to God if they were not loyal, and they were not, and they chose their own way in another God, and they had to leave the garden, actually. Let's put Romans 5, 18, maybe just a few simple words here. It talks about the perfect life of Jesus, his obedience, and it was even unto death. How does that pertain to you? How does that pertain to me? Hmm. He had a perfect life. Praise God for that. And then he did it. He learned, right, obedience through the difficulties of life. You and I, we don't like difficulty. We don't like things blowing up in our face all the time. We just don't like this stuff. I was busy yesterday evening and just before dark, I thought, boy, I've got 15 tons of gravel. We're doing this, spanning the parking lot. And uh, got my tractor and went out there. Man, I was just going to tear it up. I don't have time. I've got to get it done right now. I went out there and didn't lie about 30 minutes or whatever with the, with the bucket and so on. All of a sudden, I'm smelling oil and smell like transmission fluid. Then, oh, no, I've blown a hose. Oh, I can't hardly stand. I don't have time for this. We don't like these things, tests and trials. And you know what it was? It was the, the tire came off of the wheel. This is a tractor, pretty good sized tire. You know, some of those tractor tires and all, maybe all of them, they have liquid and fluid in them, things that's in there so it doesn't freeze or whatever. What, that gives it weight and balance and so on and so forth. That stuff was just pouring out all over the ground and I'm, I'm taking the tra tractor, I'm putting it in reverse and I'm backing up and I'm trying to get it out of the way from everything. Out. Oh, it's got a hose, it's a hose. And I look, it's just fogging out over there. Oh no. I didn't like it. I didn't have time for it. But sometimes we say we don't like things and we don't have time for it, but, <laughs> but right, it still happens, and we make time for it. Now I'm thinking, oh, man, what are we what are going to do? Well, it's unbelievable. I can't tell you all the story and go on with it. But again, it's, it's, it, 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 Christ was perfect life. He was obedient, and his obedience come through the tests and trials of life that he endures, what the Bible tells us. And so some of these are tests and trials. So I thought, oh, boy, these old, oh, boy, what am I going to do? And so yesterday evening, I, I called a roadside person. I thought, boy, that'd be nice. While I'm here at 3 a.m. <laughs> doing the programs here, I'll have them over there fixing that tire for me. Called one roadside people and uh, can't believe it. He started out, it's going to be, well, we'll come and we'll look at it and try to tie it. Well, I, well, I don't want anybody looking at it. I want them fixing it. I'm busy. And before it was over, a little short conversation, he said, well, that'll be about $800 to fix that tire. I said, oh, is that right? I'll fix it myself. I'm not about to, you know. Can you imagine anymore just take off a little tractor tire? It may have a nail hole in it. It may not have. I'm not sure what, what's wrong with it. They want $800 to come out. So I called another company. And anyway, I'm just taking testing trials. He couldn't even give a figure. He said, well, I don't know. We don't know what to say about that. I, I'll have to get the boss. And I said, man, don't you go out on the highways and fix these 18-wheelers, these tires on the spot? Anyway, they didn't like that. 
Shall we move on? It's through these tests and trials. So, you know, that kept coming through my mind most of the night. So, you know, you don't sleep about it. How am I going to do this? How am I going to do that? How am I going to raise it up? How am I going to get it off? How am I going to get it on the trailer? And then I'll just take it to the shop and let them do it. And I called another guy and he said, oh, well, any other time we might be able to help you, but the guy's going to be off tomorrow. Okay. Bible. Philippians 2, verse 8. I just had to get that off my chest. Is that all right? Thank you. Just, But it's through these things that we are tested and we're tried. And if we're found faithful, it works, doesn't it? Perfection of, of character. Philippians 2, 8 says, provided the justification, all who look to Jesus in faith. And, of course, Romans 4, 8 Blessed is the man, the Bible said, to whom the Lord will not impute sin. What does that mean? People say, well, I don't want to impute or impart or impute sin. But notice, what, what does that mean? Listen to another translation. Maybe that will help you as it did me. Blessed, in the, blessed is the man whose sin, notice this, the Lord will not take account. Isn't that beautiful? The Lord will not take us. So there's neither sins that go on that the Lord doesn't put to our account because we don't know any better. But what about those who know better? Kind of an interesting thought, isn't it? Blessed in the man whose sin will not take account. The Lord will not take account. Or the Lord will not charge to his account. I wonder how many of those that we've had in the past, as it were, because we just didn't know. The Lord didn't charge you because you didn't know. But now you know. Huh. But now think, I, I hear a lot about justification. Now remember, we're going to try to intertwine here some justification and sanctification and perfection and uh, probation and try to get this together. And grace, notice, what if we think justification, every time you ask them about justification, we will say, most generally always uh, pardon and forgiveness. Sure, justification. We are pardoned and we are forgiven. Praise God. But I'm going to tell you this. Thing. We may miss a real blessing. I'm talking about a real blessing if we just leave it at that. There's more to it. God has more involved in blessings for you and for, for me. We'll miss the blessing. Second part maybe of this would be not only has... God forgiven me. I mean, that just changes your thought. And, you know, when you really come to him and you're overladen with, with sin and the burdens of sin, you lay it out before him and you know that he's forgiven you. But there's more to it than that. You know that he's naturally, when he's forgiven you, he's imputed to me. Notice this. He's given to me his righteousness. I don't have it. He imparts his righteousness to me when we call you know righteousness of christ and then when that happens that fills my heart with 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 joy and excitement and people notice it all around you're you're not the same person anymore huh. i have hope now for the future when i didn't have hope before because what he puts inside of me so remember god is not only uh, concerned with my forgiveness but notice this he is concern with my listen carefully with my restoration right forgiveness pardon yeah but he's concerned about my restoration oh we've been forgiven yeah never, but how about restoring that relationship well i don't need to restore sure you do i do because we've sinned sin does what it separates us from god and then when we ask forgiveness and we know that we've been forgiven there's this thing called restoring you know, sometimes husband and wife or family, some they have little issues that cause separation, and that restoration must take place, that must be restored into the right relationship. Sometimes it's very quickly, and other times it's not very quick at all. Restoration. Restore my fellowship with God. So I'm encouraging you, but do that today if you have not done that. You've accepted, okay, he's, he's, he's pardoned me, he's forgiven me, I'm justified by the blood of the Lamb, but there's still something missing. Maybe it's because you're not quite restored back. Remember, when you're restored back, that relationship is 
it's no longer, oh, it's no longer you, but Christ who lives in me. It's no longer my mind, but it's his mind. No longer my choices, but the choices he makes for me because I want him to do that. Oh, that's just, I mean, it, it can just go on and, and on. And it's just a beautiful thought as far as I'm concerned. So God wants me to know. In my notes, I said, God wants me to know. Then I said, I want to repeat that. God wants me to know. He wants me to know this because it's for my own good. God wants me to know. No. Oh. Number one, not only has he forgiven me, but he's also to, you know, to treat me. This is awesome to me. The first time I learned this many years ago, or at least read it and, and tried to say, okay, you know, I, I think I might understand. He's going to treat me as though I have never sinned. Whew. I'm going to be careful about saying icing on the cake, but you, you know what I'm talking about. There's, there's so much more to it. He treats me as though I have never sinned. How can that, how can that be? What a wonderful Savior. You can read that several passages of Scripture, and, and, and Steps to Christ, about page 62. Re he treats me as though I've never sinned. That means like he's not watching, looking over me with a stick saying, oh, I'm watching you now, I'm watching you because, uh, no, as though I have never sinned. Remember uh, in the Bible, God says, I will remember your what? Come on, I will remember your sins no more. Okay, that's beautiful. Uh, Hebrews 8, uh, 12. Hebrews 8, 12. I'll remember your sins no more. Uh, uh, Jeremiah 31, uh, I think it's 34, goes and says the same thing. Isaiah 43 says the same thing. It goes on saying this, it, I will remember it no more. In other words, you just get one prophet or one Bible writer, several Bible writers, I'll remember it no more. Kenny, if you come to me and you confess your sins, you're serious about it, you stand up, you're ready to do the right thing, I'm, I'll remember no more. I'll cast them as the east and the west. Oh, that's beautiful. I'll remember your sins no more. I hope that's an encouragement to you rather than what you do sometime and what I've done in the past is I've, I've recalled my sins. I've recalled the past. I'm living in the past. No, if your sins are forgiven, you don't have to live in the past, and no one has a right to take you into the past because you have been forgiven. Oh, I like that. Now, you are treated as part of the family of God. Remember, we're talking about, oh, yeah, I, I realize, you know, there's, there's a limit to God's grace here, but you, we're, we're talking about these good things. I'm, I'm a part of the family of God now. I'm a part of his family. I'm a friend. The Bible said we are sons and daughters of God. I, I wish somebody would, I don't know if I hear some shouting or not, but think who you are, think who I am to be accounted by the king of the universe to say, you're, you're my son or you're my daughter. Wow. Think about it. Are we worthy? Absolutely not. Is Jesus? Absolutely. A friend, part of the family, sons and daughters of God. In 1 John, the Bible talks about, so jot down quickly. 1 John, I think it's chapter uh, uh, 3, verses 1 and 2. It's just, I'm not going to read all those, but you can read them for yourself. But three things that just pop out as you read this passage of Scripture. It starts out, what manner of love? that the Father bestows upon us. Here we're talking about what manner of love that God bestows on you and me who are not worthy of anything. What manner, you know, can we really find? find? And then he goes on again and says, because that, that love he has for us, we are sons and daughters of God, number two. And number three, it says, we shall be like him. This is what it's all about. We're sons and daughters of God. We're continuing to grow in grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ, and we become like him. That's what the whole point is. And I, I, I challenge you today, and I, I, I want this to be the right kind of a challenge. I'm challenging myself today. Do we, are we really growing that way? Is your life really showing that to the people you work with every day and when you go home and with your wife and whatever it might be? Wherever you're at, is it, are you really is that character that you have really like Jesus? Are you handling these situations? We're going to have tests and we're going to have trials. Remember, that develops character. But if we go and pray when we have a disaster or something that may be whatever, 
and we pray to God, we believe that he hears and we believe that he's going to answer and see fit. And then we get up and we squall and we bawl and we carry on and we complain and we don't know. That is not faith. And don't expect anything from him. Remember he told that lady, thy faith hath made thee whole. Oh, it's okay to be concerned. I've shed tears over things too, absolutely, because we're concerned. But not concerned that God's not going to do something. Not concerned because I don't believe that God's in, he's in control. I know that. So that's quite comforting, isn't it? It just may be the outcome that's fearful to me, but I still have to trust him. So let's be careful with that. Just kind of throw that in for you to think about. I'll remember your sins no more. I'm part of the family of God. Now, I want you to think with me just a moment too. We realize that there's this thing called perfect character. Christ has that perfect character. Remember, it's been imputed to me in the act of justification. Now we're going to go on to sanctification and to be imparted to me in sanctification. Now remember, what he gives and imparts to me in sanctification enables me to become like him. No, you can't do it on your own. I can't do it on my own. Oh, I'm a far cry from that. I've often said, and I continue to say it because I think it's true, then maybe it will help some of you. It helps me. There's times. The wife has to say to me, Kenny, remember, remember who you represent. Whoa, man, that's a shellacking. I should know that. Maybe I do know that. But really, is that really a part? I'm thankful she's willing to do that. That's somebody that loves you, somebody that cares for you. You might think, oh, I wish they wouldn't. Thank them for that. Remember when you're having one of those little fits, or just maybe, not, I don't think I'm having a fit when I do it. I might say, oh, honey, for Pete's sake, oh, well, you, you remember who you represent. Zip. Yeah, I've said it several times, and I'll probably say it again. I, because it's such a blessing to me. This Walk with Christ enables me what he imparts, you know, to me. Sanctification, make it be till I can be like him. So, what does that mean? That simply means one life, when we come to him and confess our sin, one life ends. Think about it. One life ends, making it possible. Am I right? It just ends. And that means separation. The old life was, we were separated, we were in rebellion, but now that comes to an end, and in justification, the old life, and now a new life begins in sanctification. Of course, of course, the work of a, of a lifetime, we, we, we realize that. But now that new life, I wonder how many today are really anxious or thinking about that new life. Really, every day you get up and you confess your sins, you go to bed at night, you do the same thing, and you get up, you start... It's a new day. It's a new day in Jesus Christ. Are you going to go back to last year, two years, or ten years? Oh, if I had no Bible, we'd be able. No, you don't want to do that. Every day is a new day in Jesus Christ, in sanctification. And in sanctification, notice, when you were rebelling, when I was rebelling against God, when I was separated from God, now with sanctification walk, it's built in love and obedience. It's just completely different. Praise God for that. One man said it like this when he was questioned, when he was asked this question. Uh, when I ask you, how are you righteous before God? How are you righteous before God? Hmm. The man's response was only, only by true faith in Jesus Christ. Huh. That, that's a pretty good answer, wouldn't you say? That's a real good answer. But then he goes on and he says, but I'm, I know as I'm going on, but I'm, I'm conscious of, of my mind and tells me that I have one time broken all the commandments of God, not just one or two, but I've broken all the commandments of God. I've fallen short. We've all sinned. That's what the Bible says. He said, in fact, when I look at it, I realize I've never kept any of them the way that I should by God's grace. And even though I'm walking in this life, I'm still prone to, this is what he said, I'm still prone to evil. What a thought. Yet, he says, yet without, notice this, without any merit of mine. 
Some people think they have some merit, something that's good. Oh, we're preaching all the time. Oh, we're teaching all the time. Oh, and so what? You get to heaven, it's not going to be by your merit. It's not because, oh, Lord, I... What does it say there? Oh, Lord, have we cast out demons, done mighty works in your name? Depart from me, I don't know you. Surely that's not you. I don't want that to be me. Christ has done all of this stuff, this man says, in me, and yet without any merit from me. I have nothing, but it's through, notice, grace that he imputes to me his perfect righteousness. No, wow. Now, here's where it is. He stole, we say, the ball into my court. Now, I just need to accept that by faith and believe it with an honest heart. How, oh, boy. Question. What is the purpose, then, of probationary time? Because, again, if we're, if we're talking about, and we are, that there's a limit to God's grace. There must be something involved in there that's talking about probationary time. Uh, when does that time, you know, come to an end? And God says, that's it. See, some of you have been dilly-dallying around with God for years. You plant, and especially some of you men, you dilly, and I've talked to many of you. You play the tough guy. Well, I don't need God, or, or I get, I've done this, I earn my own living, and I go, you do nothing on your own. Why? How do I know that? I don't know you personally, maybe. But the Bible says it's in him that we live and that we move and we have our being. You don't take a breath that's yours without God. But we don't want to give God credit because we think that might be a little sissish. Not so. Never was a greater man's man than Jesus Christ. Because some of the apostles, oh my, after they were converted, wow. People say, it's not, well, religion is for sissies. That's exactly, it's not. For real men and real women. The purpose of probationary time. And I thought, well, let's give a simple answer and then dissect it a little bit more. What is the, there must be a purpose in it. And one thing I came across that's very interesting to me is the, one of the reasons for probationary time is to give me time to get acquainted with the terms of salvation. God wants me to be acquainted, now notice carefully, with the what? With the terms of salvation. Well, what a wonderful God, what a wonderful Savior. What a powerful Holy Spirit that we serve. He wants me to realize there are terms to my salvation. Now, let's make this clear. God gives, I've said it many times, I'll continue to say it. God gives to every nation, every individual, a certain amount of time to do what? We call it probationary time. And then it closes. What does that mean? Example, example, what did we talk about in the very beginning? The Amorites, you remember? They were, it's a little closer now. They were inhabitants of Canaan. The Lord had promised the land to Canaan, you remember, of Canaan, to the Israelites. But yet, when they thought it was time to inhabit this land, ah! But it was a, a long time in coming. Why is it taking so long? You promised it to us. Why was why, why so long? Why such a long time? Be, notice, because the iniquity of the Amorites, Amorites was not yet full. And then their destruction, huh, destruction could not come until the cup was full, huh? But then the time came, they made no change. Review in Herald 5 and 2, 1893, huh? So the destruction of that, of those folks, what it says here, was not justifiable until the, the cup had been filled up. So there's a certain amount of time, and you can go on this. That's how God decides nations, and there's, there's no doubt about it in our mind as we study prophecy. We realize all we have to look at, that everything has a certain amount of time. We do. God knows that time. 
And what is our time? We're here, we're born. Well, Adam and Eve were put in the garden, what? Probationary time to see what they would do, what choice they would make. You're born on this, some just a short time, some a lot longer time. But each one was time to find out the terms of salvation and, you know, what they're going to do about it and make that choice for Jesus Christ. Your probation could, could end today. Is that true? Absolutely. But when you're young, you think not. There's no way that's going to, hey, it's going to end. I'll live forever. No, you're not. No one does in this life. We know that. That it could be cut short. And right now we're seeing over and over and over and over. Especially with a lot of the stuff that's going on in the world. A lot of people are dying at a very young age right now. Just boom, out, never sick. Something's going on. Just need to be ready. Not trying to scare somebody. Just, we need to be ready. So God decides that, and we realize it. We can go back to, to Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece. They all last a certain amount of time. We use that in history, and we find out the dates of these things. All you have to do is use your brain as it up here and look and say, oh, this here lasted 230 years or whatever. This here lasted. But, and, and when it came to an end or they were conquered, it's because probation had ended. Interesting thought, isn't it? And, and, and let me go a little farther. I think there's a certain amount of time that at for, for cities, because we realize the whole cities are going to be destroyed before Jesus comes. That's why we're encouraged to move out of the cities, get some other place, you know, and, and in preparation to go into the mountains. But how many of us are doing it? We know that we are to be prepared. And yet, are we really preparing? I heard a man say the other day, it was very interesting, and man, he is a I, my opinion, authority on uh, investing and money and stock markets and all these things here, been in for close to 40 years. I'm going to do part, part of another message on it a little later, but maybe just so I encourage, maybe somebody's listening that's saying, oh, whoa, I don't know. Remember, this country, there's a certain amount, United States of America, there's a time of probation. Are you still with me? Are we nearing the close of that probationary time as a nation? And will it come to an end because we have having, we've had great light and it seems like we've rejected that light? Things are going exactly backwards. This man says, you can be sure. And he's not a negative speaker. He's not one that just wanted to. Uh, he just said, oh, I just, I see something coming. And he said, I feel sorry for those of you who just live on Social Security. He said that when this all collapses, because if it continues to go like it's going just a little while longer, a total collapse is going to happen. It can't help but happen. You can't just keep printing it out and throwing it out by the billions and the trillions. It's going to backlash and come back. And one of the first things, here's what he said, take it or leave it. First thing to go is Social Security. Second thing is going to go, oh, well, I've got retirement and I've got it. Your retirement's going to go. Your five, you know, 401ks and all that. And all, boom, 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 gone. And then your houses are worthless. Your property becomes worthless. And then you have nothing. And as, you know, some of the world leaders say today, you just be happy with nothing. Huh? Really? All of that's gone. And then he made the last statement very interesting. He says, you know what? That's when the rich, super rich, come in and buy up all the things that you, they've taken from you. Really, you, you can't afford it anymore. Interesting. Remember, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. My only thing is that I listen to it and I say, now, no, run scared. I know it's a warning. It's a warning of what's taking place in this world. But God said, until that time is reached, there'll be... You know, he's going to be watching those judgments that fall. But after that time is reached, the judgments begin to fall. They're visited upon whatever be a city or a nation, a town, an individual. Because the Bible is clear. It said the time comes that God said, I will no, I'm not going to time. Will, I'm not going to clear the guilty in Exodus uh, 34. God will by no means clear the guilty 
purpose of probationary time, quickly, a little time left here. Why? We've been talking about, I'm going to ask this two or three different times here for the last 12 minutes or so that we have. The purpose of probationary time, you can just go over to Desire of Ages 587 says what we've been talking about. No, in every age there is given to men their day of light and privilege. And this is called equal a probationary time in which they will become more reconciled, may become more reconciled to God. But notice this, there is a limit to this grace. Mercy pleads for years and even slighted and rejected, but there comes a time. I'm talking to whoever there is re rejecting the mercy and grace of God right now. There comes a time when mercy makes her last plea. The heart becomes so hardened that it ceases to respond to the Spirit of God. Then the sweet winning voice entreats the sinner no longer. Reproofs and warnings cease. You know, sometimes when you talk to people today, there's a reproof, there's a warning, there's signs of the times that are out there, and you tell them, they, ah, I ain't worried all about that. Oh, boy, be careful, be careful. Maybe a little example, remember, time came, but Jerusalem, remember Jerusalem? I think Jerusalem, yeah. Jesus looked over Jerusalem as he looks over the world today, and the Bible said he wept. The King and Kings, the Lord of Lords. Jesus wept. It wasn't the walls. It wasn't what was in the city. It was the people. Could it be looking at us today and, and, and weeping over this, this, this whole country, the whole world? Because the city was doomed. Now, let me make this statement. I think maybe you realize it, but maybe just maybe we haven't thought along the line. Maybe you have. The city was doomed and Jesus himself and God himself could not deliver it. They can do anything, right? They have the power to do it. Then they could not deliver Jerusalem from being destroyed. Why? Because Jerusalem, the people, had exhausted every resource. They'd rejected every warning and every prophet that was sent their way. And these were the things that would help them. These were the things that, uh, you know, that would, that would help them to be able to, to do, not have to go through what they went through, but they rejected those things. Just like every time you hear this, 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 it may be repeated over and over and over and over, but don't reject it. Put it in your mind. Look at the signs of the times. Compare it with the Word of God and say, I've never seen anything like what we're living in. They had exhausted every resource that God had to save them. There was no other power by which they could be delivered other than, than God Almighty, but he couldn't do it because they rejected him and rejected all the warnings and the messages. And I'm saying today, I believe there's many in that same situation. I do, I do believe that. There's many in that same situation like the unbelieving Jews. Remember, put it simply, they had the word of God was spoken to them. The prophets spoke to them. The Holy Spirit had spoken to their hearts. God sent warning and message, warning after warning. And they chose traditions and unbelief and rebellion. Desire of Ages 587 says this, the very means, this is important, the very means he uses for, for, was used for their recovery became to them a stone of stumbling. Have you ever thought about that? I wonder who this stone of stumbling is. Could it be, Lord, could it not be, could it be Jesus? The Holy Spirit was sent to help them, but what? They, became, they didn't, they rejected it. They didn't want it. So then it became something they stumbled over. They became disobedient. But the Bible is clear when you read like Isaiah 8, 14 and 1 Peter 2, uh, 7 and 8. It becomes very, very clear to those who believe the stone is very precious. It's to the unbelievers 
that is something they stumble over because they don't want the truth. Many today laugh at the words of Christ. They choose darkness rather than light. There's no doubt about that. Darkness covers their deeds many times. Now in the country we live in, doesn't make any difference what time of day or night it is. Huh. Hidden, their hidden sins are brought to light. But God's people today are to be reprovers of sin. And when you are a reprover of sin, regardless if you're a minister, an elder, deacon, whatever it might be, or a member of a church, you have a responsibility. And I have a, I have a responsibility. A reprover, huh? A reprover is going to meet rejection. A reprover of sin sometimes going to be laughed at. Can you take it? Oh, wow. They're going to be mocked. They're going to be a lot of talk going on behind your back. People trying to make sport of you. Ah, I don't know what he's talking about. And listen, the sad thing is that many of them among our own say those kind of things. But you're, listen, if you're our own, you wouldn't be doing that. Think about that. We must support that which we believe is truth and right and someone proclaiming that. We have to support that and encourage it. Purpose of probationary time. Again, it's interesting. Number two, it says to form or to, notice this, remove defects of character. Why has God given us probationary time? But why does he tell us there we have to be careful because there's, there's a limit to his grace. There's a probationary time. He's given us so you can find out the plan in terms of salvation. And then he's given it to us that we're right now so that we can remove, by God's grace, his strength, the defects in our characters. That's what he wants from me and for you is get rid of those defects. 2 Testimony 691, 2T 691 says this. Many entertain the view that probation is granted after Jesus leaves his work as a mediator in the most holy apartment. But notice this. This is a sophistry. This is a what? A deception. This is a lie. This is wishy-washy. The old devil's lie. Huh. Of Satan. God tests his people. Do you believe that we're living in that hour that we're being tested and proved? Characters that are to be formed are to be formed right now before probation closes. And that we can't make that change ourselves. We need the help of God. You say, yeah, 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 I know it. But is it time maybe if, if it's not changing, if you're the same old, same old, if you've got that mean old ugly temper that you've always had, maybe we should go to the closet. Still using the language you shouldn't use, you should go to the closet. If you're still smoking that which you shouldn't be smoking and drinking that which you shouldn't be drinking, maybe you should go to the closet. I hope I can be playing with you. I do it because I love you. I'm not trying to hurt anybody. If our attitude is the same, we're selfish and we're greedy and, you know, we sit in the pews and, you know, we're more holy than the rest of us. Something's wrong. The character's not like that of Jesus Christ. He's giving us time. He's giving you time to come to him and to behold him. If you choose to live the life of sin, then he's going to let you do it. If you're neglecting the offer of salvation, then time's going to come. Close the probation. It's going to happen. Mm. And it closes, you know, when Christ stands up in Revelation 15, 8, you know, and says it's finished. Where will you stand? Where will I stand? There's a time of probation that you can learn and I can learn what is truth. Not what the devil puts out there. Not what most people are preaching and teaching today. Not truth. Why? How do I know? It doesn't harmonize with Scripture. It might harmonize somewhat with one passage. Well, you did line, line upon line. It's not. And yet some of you, most of you are happy with that. Please don't be. Come to God and say, I, I want to know what truth is. 2 Peter 3, 16. So there's a group of people that they read the passage of Scripture and then they do a, whoa, they do a wrestling match with it. 
They just twist and turn it and try to make it say whatever they want it to say. The Bible says these are people who do that are unlearned and they are unstable. Huh. Trying to force it to say something that it doesn't say. My brothers and my sisters, we realize today there is a limit to God's grace. There's a lot we won't be able to cover, but I just I want you to think this as we close today. And where do you stand? Where do you stand in these closing moments of earth history? I ask myself that every day. I'm not challenging you with anything I don't challenge myself with. And I take an honest look in the mirror and say, oh God, I need, I need your grace. I know there's a limit. I don't want to spurn it, and I need it. And so let me follow you. Let me walk in your footsteps. Are you growing spiritually today, or are you, you know, living up to the light that you know, or are you, what are you, or are you dying? Will God continue to plead with you and continue to plead with me? I pray that he does. It's good news if you hear that voice. If you feel a need that you need to come to him, you know, there's, there's hope. That means the Holy Spirit is, is still working. If you don't hear that still, small voice and you have no need of a Savior, you, have, you say, no need of anything else. Oh, we need to be praying. You need to go to him right now. Ask God to help you. You know why? Because there is a limit to God's grace. May I pray for you as we close right here? And while I'm praying for you, would you pray for me too, please? Let's pray together. Merciful God in heaven, what a privilege it is to know you. What a privilege it is to know that you, you give us that grace and we, it's so full and so bountiful, but there, there comes a time. Help us to realize that in life. That would just help us to make the right choice and right decision that we can be ready to meet you when you shall come. Oh, Lord, I need your grace abundantly. Bless us, we pray. Those who have made that decision right now today to follow you all the way, in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, and we look forward to spending some more time with you, you know, as we study the Word of God together. We love you. Thank you again. God bless you. See you next time.